Hello, my name is Michael Tessera and I've uh, prepared this presentation called ACCC Cheat Sheet, August 2023. And if you watch the last one that I prepared back in July or for July, the idea behind it was that uh, I was talking to a compliance officer who said that uh, reading all the ACCC press releases that come out every month has taken him so long that he wouldn't have time to do anything else. So I thought it might be good to do a little summary of uh, the ACCC press releases come out each month and uh, and what I'm seeking to do is to catch up. So I did July, this is August and hopefully next couple of weeks I do September, October and I catch up. So a bit of background about myself. I'm a competition consumer lawyer and I run my own practice to say early consulting and I've been doing that 15 years and I help companies and individuals with competition and consumer law matters. I also do some expert consultancy work for various uh, legal publishers on competition and consumer law and then prior to that I worked at the ACCC in a variety of roles. My last job there was as a director of enforcement but also worked as a director in charge of the Sydney Mergers and Asset Sales branch for a few years. Now the outline will be pretty similar every month. It'll start with court decisions, then look at enforcement actions taken by the ACCC, then look at any mergers that the ACCC has decided in the month, guidelines, scams, inquiries and consultations and then sort of catch-all area of other. Now the three decisions handed down by the courts in uh, August, the first was a finding a liability and the second two, Dell and Bluescope, were in the imposition of penalty. So liability had been found earlier on. Now the first thing about the Delta case is that I'm actually doing a bit of work for them and I put on an affidavit uh, for the panel hearing coming up, so I won't be talking about this case in too much detail. But in broad terms, Justice Bromwich found that Delta had engaged in an attempt to enter into a price fixing agreement as well as the sole director, Tim Davis. And this related to a tender for the National Gallery of Australia for building management systems. And it arose from a very short cafe meeting back in December 2019 between Mr. Davis and a competitor of a company called LES. And the conversation that was uh, found by the court, so the court was uh, faced with two competing com versions of the conversation that occurred between Mr. Davis and the general manager of LES in this cafe. And this is the version that the judge preferred. So as you can see, it's a very short conversation and uh, it's probably about two minutes maximum conversation. And the judge found that this uh, uh, showed an intent to enter into a, a price fixing arrangement. The second case involved Dell, and this was a strange case where Dell immediately admitted that it uh, had engaged a breach of legislation. This related to standalone monitors. So on its uh, website, it was uh, claiming that it was cheaper to buy a monitor through a bundle as opposed to buying it on a standalone basis. And that was not correct for all the relevant monitors. So actually buying it at a standalone was cheaper. And so that meant the strike through prices which appeared in relation to some monitors was incorrect. And also some of the representations about the discounts available off the price of the add-on or standalone monitor were incorrect. So they made representations about total savings, include X percent off, discounted price and so on. So this seems to me to be an error that's arisen from uh, probably a bit of a breakdown in the way they're posting information on their website, which if you've ever been to Dell website, it's a complicated uh, beast. It's got lots of different variations and you can add in uh, different variations to your um, your package. So something went wrong, obviously, at the back end, and it, it translated to a problem on the advertised prices. Now, the penalty was agreed as well, and the judge was happy to sign off on the $10 million penalty, which was $7 million for the strike-through representations and $3 million for the price representations. Obviously, saw the strike-through representations as being more serious. And I think one thing that counted against Dell in this particular case was they were alerted to the problems about their pricing and they're very slow to take action to remedy that problem. So I guess it's a big organisation and things don't move very quickly, but the judge seemed to be somewhat surprised that after becoming aware of this problem, Dell didn't move quicker to resolve it. Now, one of the most significant cases uh, of recent times have been the Blue Scope Steel case, both at the liability stage, but also at the penalty stage. 
And uh, I guess uh, the liability was determined back in December 2022. Uh, Justice O'Brien found that both Blue Scope and Mr Ellis, who was general manager, had engaged in cartel conduct. And this was an attempt as well. They were attempting to arrange a price fix in relation to flat steel products in Australia. And uh, this saw Mr Ellis approaching a number of competitors, both domestically and overseas, and uh, proposing that they increase their prices and a uh, price list was provided to them and they're encouraged to follow the prices in that price list. And it was a failed uh, price fix. So none of the people approached by uh, Mr. Ellis uh, agreed to commit themselves to these high prices. So it was unsuccessful. Now, some interesting background is Mr. Ellis was actually charged back in 2019 with two counts of seeking to obstruct a Commonwealth official in the performance of their duty. So effectively, the allegation was that Mr. Ellis had approached two other employees of Blue Scope and tried to encourage them to tell a version of events as to what had occurred to the HCC, which is not true, and he got caught out. And so he got charged uh, with obstruction offences, pleaded guilty in September 2020, and he was convicted and actually sentenced to eight months imprisonment, but immediately released on a recognizance order. Now, as I said earlier, the, uh, uh, the decision came down in August and Michael O'Brien decided to impose very large penalties against the corporation. So he imposed a, a penalty of $57.5 million against Blue Scope for the attempt and $575,000 on Mr Ellis. Now, the interesting thing there is that Mr Ellis's penalty is 1% of the penalty imposed against Blue Scope, which seems somewhat surprising given that all the conduct was actually engaged in by Mr Ellis. So that's probably an issue that is somewhat puzzling, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, in deciding to impose the penalty, what uh, Justice O'Brien said was that it was important to impose a substantial penalty uh, against Blue Scope to achieve specific and general deterrence, and it was very serious conduct. It was carried out at a senior level in the company, and this is the interesting bit. It's potential to occasion significant loss of damage to acquirers of flat steel products, the potential to deliver substantial financial gain. And he notes also that Blue Scope was a very profitable company. So effectively, the penalty has been imposed not on the actual harm caused by the conduct, because it was an attempt and it failed, and so there was no actual harm, but rather on the potential harm and the potential benefit that would have been derived to Blue Scope had it been successful. So the big fine is effectively uh, proportional to the potential benefit which Blue Scope would have uh, derived from the conduct had it been successful. And he counted in their favour the fact that Blue Scope had made substantial efforts to strengthen its compliance program and hadn't previously been found to breach the law, uh, the cartel provisions. So they got a bit of discount for that. So you imagine the penalty would have been bigger had it not been for those two factors. In relation to Mr Ellis, it's again very interesting because he notes that a significant penalty is required to deter repetition by Mr Ellis and by anybody else who thinks they might uh, go down the same path. And this is a thing about you know weighing up the risks of being caught versus the rewards, how much you're going to benefit if you can pull it off. But he also makes the point that the deterrent effect of any penalty cannot be undermined by the ability of the company directors and officers to insure against the financial cost of the penalty. So that's an important observation by the judge. I think the three, there's probably two significant issues on an individual basis, but I think the first important issue is that the judge is focused very much on the potential benefit, potential, uh, potential detriment if the conduct had occurred and he imposed a very high penalty for that reason. And that is probably controversial. And is that the correct approach to take? And has he got the numbers right? Is is the penalty too high? 57.5 million is by far the biggest penalty ever awarded for an attempt to enter into a price fix. So it sounds, personally, it sounds too high to me. And by the same token, 1% of the penalty is being opposed against Mr. Ellis, who's a prime mover and did all the work. The disparity between the penalty against Blue Scope and the penalty against him seems uh, too far, too big. And so I think maybe the penalty against Blue Scope is too high and the penalty against Mr. Ellis is too low. 
Two other interesting observations were made by the court in relation to individual respondents. Firstly, there are no disqualification orders available for an attempt, and that's purely the way the legislation has been drafted. Uh, it's probably an oversight, but clearly uh, the ACCC could not seek a disqualification order against Mr Ellis because it's not available, and this is uh, the case for all attempts. Um, now, the second point is that he made an order, Justice O'Brien, that Mr Ellis cannot rely on his insurance policy to defray the cost of the penalty. And he says this would really undermine the whole specific deterrence value of the penalty if Mr Ellis could simply get uh, the insurance to pay. So clearly, an insurance policy can still be used to pay for the individual's legal costs, as long as individuals taking out the policy themselves, not the firm. So the firm can't buy an insurance policy for their staff member. That's against the law. But if the individual takes out insurance policy, they can use it to pay their fees, legal fees, but they can't use it to seek a payment or reimbursement of the pecuniary penalty. And again, that's not what I thought was the situation. I thought you could insure against that risk. So I guess both Blue Scope has appealed and Ellis has appealed. Blue Scope, I think, has appealed the size of the penalty, thinks it's too big. And Ellis has probably appealed this order that he can't use insurance to, to fray the, the, the payment of the penalty. Now enforcement, it was probably a bit of a quiet month in terms of enforcement, except for one case. But looking at these first three cases, Horton Industries alleged to engage in RPM in relation to bikes. And uh, again, the ACCC settled this with a undertaking and not taking the company to court. There was an interesting case with fertiliser suppliers and effectively the AGC came across a number of fertiliser suppliers who it believed had unfair contract terms and each of these companies agreed to amend the terms of their contracts to remove potentially unfair contract terms. And as you can see, a couple of examples, unilaterally vary the quantity uh, of, of the contract and also restrict buyers' rights to raise issues about defects with the goods. So they sound pretty unfair. The interesting thing about this case was that Fortunately for the fertiliser suppliers, they were able to keep their name out of the press. So in the media release, and uh, there's no reference to who the companies are. So that was a um, pretty good outcome for them. Pet Circle also got into trouble for the way it was advertising pricing at its checkout on its online store in relation to discount pricing and was now pricing. And not super serious, they paid a infringement notice for 26640 the biggie was uh, the Qantas case. It's been all over the press, and it's sort of a bit, I don't know, surprising what's been going on. I don't sort of understand what's been happening. But in, in general terms, there was an allegation that Qantas had been engaging in false and misleading conduct in relation to the tickets that it was selling and the status of various flights. So as you can see in point two, their Qantas kept selling tickets on its website for an average of more than two weeks, and in some cases up to 47 days for more than 8,000 flights scheduled to depart between May and June 2020, sorry, May and July 2022 after cancellation of the flights. So they cancel the flight and they keep advertising it. So you've got to question yourself, why are they doing that? Like, has their system let them down? Has there been some sort of glitch in their system and they have just haven't taken these flights off? Or are they doing it intentionally? And I guess, you know, if you, if you don't tell somebody you've cancelled their flight, they're not going to know to go and find another flight. So I guess that might be the reason you don't tell them. It seems like a short-term strategy because they're not going to be very happy when they do find out. The second allegation related to Qantas not notifying existing ticket holders that their flights have been cancelled for an average of 18 days and in some cases up to 48 days for more than 10,000 flights. So one is you keep trying to sell tickets to flights that have been cancelled. And the second one is you don't tell the people who are booked on that flight that their flight has been cancelled. And again, what would you do if you were told your flight was cancelled? You'd go and try and find another flight. So it's very strange conduct. You can't help but thinking maybe there's a anti-competitive um, purpose behind all this. I don't know what the ACCC got in terms of uh, documents from Qantas. It did use its uh, coercive powers to get documents out of Qantas. So maybe it's got some absolute smoking smoking gun documents. But this, this conduct seems more uh, directed to maybe... 
uh, anti-competitive outcome, but the ACCC is using the consumer law to, I guess, achieve maybe a more pro-competitive outcome. And as you can see, the ACCC, it's a very long press release and they've got quite a lot of detail in there, but they actually say in one of the paragraphs, Qantas cancelled almost one in four flights in the period between May and July 2022 with about 15,000 out of 66 domestic and international flights from airports in all states and mainland territories. So cancelling a lot of flights and you've got to think, why does the airline cancel so many flights? Um, what's it trying to achieve? It just It's unlikely to be a glitch. Um, it seems uh, potentially to have some anti-competitive aim in mind. Another biggie for August was the ACCC's decision to oppose the ANZ Suncorp merger. And again, this is a, a, a big decision by the ACCC. The companies had applied for authorization under the Act, and this was to get approval to run the merger. And there's two tests that are looked at. Firstly, whether the merger is going to substantially lessen competition. So if it's not going to substantially lessen competition, then that would be let through. Or alternatively, it's going to lessen competition, but the public benefits outweigh the detriments and so can be allowed that way. Well, the ACCC decided on the 4th of August that the tests weren't met and accordingly it didn't approve the merger. So the ACCC provided a lot of detail in its press release and it's very interesting that it was not satisfied the acquisition was not likely to substantially lessen competition in the supply of home loans nationally to small and medium enterprise in small and medium enterprise banking in Queensland and agribusiness banking. And their concerns were spelled out quite uh, in quite a bit of detail. Firstly, they believe that these second tier banks such as Suncorp provided a lot of competition to the major banks. And this is particularly due to the high barriers to entry. They also were concerned at the oligopolistic structure in the banking market. They've got four big banks who seem to uh, not compete very hard against each other, move lockstep, tend to mirror each other's conduct. And uh, so they said the risk of coordinated market outcome was enhanced due to the major banks adopting a live and let live approach aimed at maintaining or protecting their existing market shares instead of competing strongly in price, innovation and quality. So they don't think it's a competitive market. The big four tend to uh, follow each other's actions very closely. And so this is just taking competitive influence out of the market. Suncorp's providing probably more competition to the big four than the big four are providing to each other. And they also go a bit further and say there's actually a present risk of coordination. So that's saying the banks may actually go a step further and start colluding, uh, you know, either implicitly or explicitly. Uh, they said there's a high probability of uh, price signaling. They're very similar in terms of their size and structure and the stability of the market. So they're saying that the, this, removing a vigorous competitor from the market is going to less competition. They also had other particular areas of concern in relation to small and medium enterprise banking services in Queensland. The fact that Suncorp is an important competitor in the SME sector. Suncorp offers differentiated products to SME customers and it has a vigorous agribusiness uh, business. And so I guess what you're seeing is that the ACCC has concern about the whole merger and also particular concerns about these areas. So it doesn't seem there's much chance of the merger getting through. If, if the ACCC's concerns were limited to these areas, maybe there could be some divestitures uh, undertaken to remove the ACCC's concerns, but the ACCC is concerned about the whole transaction. The ACCC is required to consider the counterfactual, so it's got to look at the, the future with and without the merger. And this particular case, they saw two possible counterfactuals. One is that Suncorp continued to operate as it is now, and the second that it merges with another second tier bank, specifically Bendigo and or Adelaide Bank. And they conclude there was a realistic prospect of ANZ, sorry, of Suncorp uh, merging with either Bendigo or Adelaide or both in the future. And they said that would be a much better outcome than the ANZ tie-up. And they noted that Suncorp had actually explored the prospects of this tie-up in the past. So it wasn't purely hypothetical. 
Now, they had to look at the public benefit. So, as you know, it's any competitive detriment, but also whether the public benefit outweigh the detriments. And here they acknowledged there were some benefits arising from the acquisition in terms of cost savings, but they didn't think that those public benefits outweighed the detriments, which were very high. So the next steps, ANZ and Suncorp have appealed the ACCC authorisation decision to the Australian Competition Tribunal. It'd be interesting to see how ACCC goes there. They've had a lot of uh, uh, bad outcomes in the ACT historically, although the most recent matter went their way with uh, the ACT backing their decision to say no to the Telstra TBG uh, tie-up. And there's other approvals that need to be obtained in addition to ACCC or ACT approval. Also, you need the approval of the Treasurer and the Queensland Government. Now, they issued a guideline in August, and this was a gas market code guidelines, and this is quite complicated stuff, and so I won't go through it in a huge amount of detail. But in general terms, the gas market code has four major areas. Price rules, so the prohibition of supply above a reasonable price, initially set at $12, $12 per gigajoule. Good faith obligations, so when parties negotiate, they must do it in good faith. Negotiations uh, have to be done a certain way, expressions of interest, offers and negotiations, and the, there has to be a lot of um, record keeping undertaken. So that's what the gas market code sets out and what the ACCC has issued some guidelines to explain to the market how it's going to go about um, enforcing the code and administering the, the, the different elements of this particular code. So there's uh, three different tiers of conduct and the penalties differ depending on what tier conduct it is. So as you can see, the most serious conduct breaches the price rules, the good faith requirements or compliance with exemption conditions. So the HCC can exempt uh, uh, gas suppliers from requirements under the code, but if they do grant exemption and there's certain conditions attached and the company breaches those, they can get into trouble. Tier two conduct, negotiation requirements, procedural risk agreements, and tier three conduct, record keeping, and also obligation to provide additional or corrected information. Now, the penalties are very large for tier one. They're the penalties we're all very familiar with under the Competition Consumer Act and the ACL. $50 million, three times the benefit, or 30% of the adjusted turnover, and for individuals, 2.5 million, and then it drops down for tier two, 6,000 penalty units, 1,200 for an individual, 3,000 penalty units, or 600 penalty units for individual. So they drop down quite significantly from uh, tier one to tier three. Now, scams, there was a bit of activity in scams. The first was the ACCC granted interim authorization to the ABA and the banks, uh, allowing them to start having discussions amongst themselves on different ways to prevent, detect and disrupt scams. And so it's an interim authorization. So it allows the, the, the banks and the ABA to get together and start talking. But this is subject to the HLC going to the market and working out whether this is a good idea to let these uh, various organizations uh, get together in a room. And given some of the concerns that expressed earlier in relation to ANZ uh, ANZ Suncorp merger, maybe it's not such a good idea. The second one was a scam alert, and this arose from the Matildas' uh, uh, great run in the Women's World Cup recently, and uh, that's the way scammers operate. They see something like that occurring, a big event, sporting teams uh, uh, doing uh, very well in a competition, and they immediately come out with a scam. So the ACCC warned uh, people in the market that there was a scam happening and they should watch out for it. So it involved fraudulent ticket sales and fake live stream links to matches. So this is very good to get this information out ASAP so that people can uh, protect themselves. Inquiries and consultations, there were two issued this month. The first was um, water monitoring reports. So the ACCC has this role in, in regular, uh, monitoring the prices in the Murray-Darling Basin, and it specifically looks at the regulated water charges, compliance with water rules, and also transformation arrangements. So effectively allowing uh, irrigators to convert their irrigation right into a water access entitlement. So they monitor all this stuff. And I think the, the it was probably not the most exciting report in the sense that they found that the water charges had fallen in real terms over the relevant period. 
but there'd been low low numbers of transformation termination. So it's fairly stable market, uh, not not too much going on there of concern to the ACCC. The other one was the airport monitoring report, and the ACCC has been monitoring the prices charged by the airports, the four major airports, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and Perth, for a number of years now. And their report came out about the 2021-2022 period. And they're looking at uh, aeronautical charges and car parking pricing. So they're two uh, major revenue streams for the, for the airports. And obviously the finding was that the traffic through the airports hadn't increased significantly to the pre-COVID level. So it's still in the recovery phase, it's still below the results achieved prior to the pandemic. Now this table in the uh, report that was quite interesting, it might be a bit too small to really read very carefully, but you can see the on the top left, the drop in the number of passengers, and then you can also see the various margins. So they're still making quite good margins. They're obviously making uh, lesser margins from flights because the flights haven't really risen to the pre uh, uh, level amounts but the key thing here is the revenues that they generate from their car parking remain very very high they've got an incredible amount of power to levy very high prices in car parking and that's that's really the area where they continue to um, rake in the dough now in the other category there was uh, a few interesting uh, issues. The first was the electricity plans. And this was just like a, a press release put out there to just alert consumers to developments in the market. And clearly there's two types of offer in the market. There's your uh, standing offer and your market offer. And a lot of people went to the market offer to try and get lower prices. And that made sense. But the funny thing is that it's actually the standing offer that's subject to this safety net. So the, the standing offers can't go up above a certain safety net, but the market offers can. So you had this funny situation where people had moved to market offers to try and reduce their electricity charges, but now it's actually maybe better to be on a standing offer, mainly because the safety net applies. So what the ACCC is saying is, you really should check this out if you're a consumer of electricity and you're on a market offer because it might be in your best interest financially to switch over to a standard uh, a standard offer which sounds a bit strange <laughs> but um you know it's important information to get out to consumers then the mbn co submitted a revised variation and this has been going on for ages they keeps uh, proposing a special access undertaking, which sets the rules for broadband providers to access the MBN. And this can include wholesale price controls and minimum standard levels. So it's been rejected previously. They submitted a new one, and then the ACCC goes to the market and asks people what they think about it. So that consultation began on the 16th of, sorry, on the 23rd of August. Then there was the Qantas Emirates, and these are a lot of types between various um, airlines to uh, co coordinate and cooperate on various on various routes, and this is often due to um, the significant cost savings that can be can be derived from that. And this actually related to a authorization in relation to cargo flights, and um, or both passenger and cargo flights. And the ACCC thought that the public benefit was such that it could continue to operate until 2028, although they had a few concerns about some of the routes, so they did put some conditions attached to it. And then the final one was a very interesting one, Graco, who is actually um, a company that sells paint sprays, applied to the ACCC through the notification process for approval to uh, engage in resale price maintenance. So it sought to set a minimum uh, retail price for its various retailers. And the way this works is you submit your application to the ACCC, and if they don't object, then it's uh, it's approved. The ACCC actually have to um, actively say to the, the applicant that it's not approved, and that's what happened in this case. The ACCC did not believe there were any public benefits arising from this particular RPM application, and so it came out and said, we don't approve it we revoke it and uh, the only benefits arising with this particular proposal are private benefits to the company. So I don't think the ACCC has approved any RPM notifications yet and I think it'd be very unlikely for them to do so. 
Now, just a bit of commentary quickly. Blue Scope and, and the Ellis case are very significant matters, not just in terms of the the discussion of the penalty issues, but also the case law um, in the initial judgment. So I guess Michael O'Brien's taken on these big issues and, and made some pretty interesting findings, both on um, the, the penalty side for the corporation and for the penalties for the individuals. And so these are going to be appealed and I don't know what's going to happen, but I have a feeling that um, maybe the blue scope penalty will be reduced. And I think Ellis might be looking at an increase in his penalty. The question is whether the appeal court decides that he can actually access his insurance to pay the penalty. The ANZ Suncorp is going to be a massive case. It's going to be very lengthy and going to be very, very hotly contested. Um, I, I like the ACCC's chances on that one. I think they'll be successful at the tribunal. Qantas case is going to be very hard fought. And I think just this week, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but Qantas has filed its defence and been subject to quite a bit of ridicule. It's one of the cases where I think um, Qantas might, at the end of the day, just uh, throw a bit of money at it and, and make it go away. It's doing so much damage to them uh, in, in their uh, reputation and brand. It might be just... Uh, good idea to, to uh, start talking with the ACCC. The ACCC's trend of not litigating RPM cases continues, which I think is a good thing. I don't think you should be litigating those cases, particularly, well, you shouldn't be in those cases where the companies engaged in the conduct really don't understand the law. Should, I think, um, 87B is the way to go. The gas market code is likely to be a very hot area going forward. I think the ACCC is going to take a lot of enforcement action in that area. The guidelines are a good start to explain how things are going to operate, but I think it's, it's complicated and I think there's going to be a lot of um, non-compliance, some of it unfortunately intentional, some of it probably just inadvertent. And then as a bit of a spoiler, I'm just going to ruin the, uh, ruin the, uh, the suspense here, but NBN do get their SAU across the line in coming months and so we can all uh, uh, sleep better knowing that now. So um, hopefully that's been helpful. I think it's a, it's been an interesting month. Every month, I think, is just so much work being uh, generated by the ACCC. Big cases, you know, when you look at the ANZ Suncorp case and then you look at the Qantas case, they're big cases. And every month they've got a big case coming along. So they're not shy of uh, doing the hard yards and, and heavy lifting. So if you have any questions about this particular uh, presentation, feel free to give me a call or send me an email. Bye-bye.